when he first called me and said, look, I have something that I want to talk to you about, it was kind of an immediate yes, because just knowing Lynn, it was like, well, whatever he's being drawn to, whatever he wants to create, I know it's going to have certain qualities. I know it's going to be rich. It's going to be deep. It's going to be very heartfelt. It's going to be complex. It's going to be intellectual. It's going to be moving. It's going to be very funny. It's, it's going to be the full storytelling meal. Hi, I'm Andrew Garfield, and this is how I became Jonathan Larson. I learned really about Jonathan Larson through Lin-Manuel Miranda asking me to play him in this film adaptation of his one-man show that turned into a three-person off-Broadway show, Tick, Tick, Boom, that began called, being called Boho Days, and it was just him with a piano and his friend Roger Bart doing backup vocals. So for me, it was Lynn really introducing me to John. I knew Rent, of course, and I loved Rent the Musical, but it was a very superficial relationship that I had with John. And I think I'm kind of grateful for that in retrospect because it meant I came into this process of becoming John and, and deep diving into who John was in a way that didn't feel precious. It didn't feel like I was coming in with a lot of baggage of the man, the myth, the legend, Jonathan Larson, but actually I was able to meet him in a more pure kind of essential way. I wanted to honor him in the way that I think he would actually wish to be honored, which was for all of his humanity, all of his messiness, all of his ordinariness, as well as this kind of extraordinary talent um, and, and, and gift that he had and he gave to the world and also all of his magic because he was an incredibly magical person but he was also an incredibly human person as well. So I'm indebted to Lin-Manuel really for introducing me to a long lost brother that I didn't realize I had. That's, that's the kinship that I, I immediately started to feel when I started to unpick and uncover who John was. Hello. Hi, welcome. I'm Jonathan Larson. He had me in mind to play John and I was doing Angels in America on Broadway at the time and he basically said yes to doing a kind of talk back Q&A with myself, Tony Kushner and the company. But he had agreed to do it to get close to me. And I was like, that was a totally unnecessary elaborate roundabout circumnavigation of a very simple thing that all you had to do was put out the call and I would show up. And then we had a lunch and he kind of, he slid, you know, Jonathan Larson's score and lyrics for Tick Tick Boom across the table to me at this sushi place in Midtown. And he said, this is not gonna make sense yet, but I promise you it will. And he kind of sold me John. And he kind of talked me through the song, Why, which is the song that I sing in the Delacorte Theater towards the end of the film. He kind of talked me through that song and he was tearing up and I was tearing up and I thought, oh dear. It was immediately one of those no brainers of like, I want to work with you, I'm dying to work with you. And then just hanging with him, I had to settle my nervous system because you know, he's, Hamilton was on repeat in my iPhone at the time. And it was like, my playlist was asking for a meeting. It was like, <laughs> a crazy thing and yeah we just kind of he just kind of talked me through john and kind of sold me john pitched me john and it was like oh this is this sounds like my my brother and and i i started to do my own diving and i thought well if he wants me to do this i'm doing it and even if i don't know if i can sing or not or get to the place of playing piano or not I, i'm i'm gonna commit because he said he wasn't gonna shoot it within the year i thought well that's enough time for me to see if i can sing like if i can't sing within a year then i you know i should give up I work at the Moondance Diner. Check. One sec. Do we take reservations? No, we do not take, we're, we're a diner. Never played piano, sang in the shower and karaoke, and, and dancing is one of my favorite things to do and never done it outside of on a dance floor. To be a musical theater actor, to be a song and dance person has always been something I've longed for. Cause like I had a very formal theater training when I was 17, 18, 19, 20. It wasn't musical theater, it was just theater. It was like, you know, studying classics and modern playwriting, but I didn't get the opportunity to dive into this other 
area that maybe I was too scared to try or didn't feel like I had a natural propensity and talent for. It was always this kind of dream that was beyond me being able to dream it into reality until, of course, the Dreamweaver arrives, who is Lin-Manuel Miranda. And so, yeah, so I really took a year to get my chops up and, and worked with Liz Kaplan, who's an incredible vocal um, singing teacher and a couple of great piano teachers. And then Lin's team as well and all this cast, everyone just kind of held me and pushed me deeper and deeper towards, you know, past that fear of failure and, and the voice cracking and making horrible sound. And in terms of becoming John, it's like, he wasn't concerned how he sounded. He was just singing for his life and he was singing for the lives of everyone around him. That was his way of giving healing to the world and to his community was through his music, was through his gift and advocating for his community in that regard. So it was life and death for John in all those ways. So the singing was an extension or an expression of, or a kind of like a soul cry to say, we are here and we, we, we want to just live. My, my friends want to just live and I want to just live. And it's like that Job on top of the mountain thing. It's like, you better hear me, like we're here and let us be here and let us fulfill our lives in the in the biggest way we can possibly fulfill. And that's what he was singing for. So the passion was much more important than the sound, but the sound follows the passion, so. What if the workshop happens and nothing changes? What then, Jonathan? Maybe I'm just wasting my time. Do you know how many Jonathan Larsons there are? One. You know, I think about John being 36 and, and dying without having received any of the harvest of his work. I think about Vincent van Gogh. I think about the unquenchable desire that they must have woken up with every morning in the face of rejection, being misunderstood, misperceived, kind of looked at as kooks, insane people, trying to revolutionize an art form in both their cases and being kind of told to shut up and still picking up the brush, and still sitting at the keyboard. There it is. Um, this is a recreation of John's, of John's um, apartment where he wrote and where he played. And he still sat in that director's chair and bashed it out, surrendered to the fact that he may never see it. That's what, that is the struggle of all of, all of us. Of course, I've had periods of that in my life. I think anyone who, who's lived has that experience of like, you know, having to recommit to a gift, recommit to a calling, a vocation, or a feeling of destiny, even no matter how foolish it may feel, or no matter how afraid you are that you're not gonna be able to put a roof over your head and get groceries. That is a rites of passage, I think, especially for an artist, a young artist. It's much easier to carry on when you, when you, when you get told to carry on by the world, by your community, by, you know, uh, audiences, whatever that is, like that is a gift that I'm never ever gonna take for granted. The fact that I get to be in a space full of 1400 people every night in terms of when we were doing Angels in America, that was the capacity of our theater and to have a, 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 an exchange and an interchange with an audience and for them to say, we, to, for them to be quiet and silent and to be in a kind of silent dialogue with the actors on stage, that is the purest form of what we're talking about in terms of receiving the kind of, the energy and the encouragement to continue. He was getting his energy and encouragement from elsewhere, from his friends, from some crazy divine theater god muse that knew that he had rent inside him and that knew that he wasn't gonna be here for a long time and that knew he had to get rent out before he passed. So I, I, it's deeply mysterious and deeply beautiful. And yeah, there's a strange thing where you go, man, I am I am lucky that I get to, you know, have my work reflected back to me in a way that feels authentic. That's, that's a gift that I'm not gonna take for granted for sure. In the blue silver chromium diner. Sunday is a sequence that Lin Manuel Lin Manuel Miranda cooked up in honor of John, you know, in honor of the fact that this song that was a pastiche kind of tongue in cheek ironic honoring of his hero Stephen Sondheim, that John had only ever sung solo at a piano with this one voice just belting this number. So for Lynn, it was like, he never got to hear it. John never got to hear it with a, with a choir. 
So Lin was like, I'm, if he's out there, I'm going to make him hear it. And I'm going to fill this music, these verses and chorus up with this galaxy brained Jonathan Larson choir of musical theater legends, past, present and future, even some musical theater geniuses that he never got a chance to see work. And then people from the Rent Company and then like his heroes, including Bernadette Peters and Andre the Shields and Brian Stokes Mitchell and B.B. Newworth. So for Lynn, it was like, this is my way of giving John his harvest and his flowers at the back row of the galaxy, wherever he is, so that he can really feel and hear it. I found that really moving. And then on the day, you know, it's like, well, we're in the middle of COVID. It was overwhelming, but we got it in little, because none of the actors could be together. We had to plate it. We had to do it with lots of visual effects, with locked off shots. So no actors got to interact. So everyone was brought in individually and plated into this, into each kind of shot which kind of was, was horrible, but also at the same time, it meant that we could have sacred time with each legend that came in. So when Bernadette came in, it was the Bernadette five hours. And then when BB came in, it was the BB five hours. Like it was just like, we got like, so me and Lynn and the crew, we got to just have our like little kind of like immersive theater experience with each one of these kind of genius people. It felt like, like Lin-Manuel Miranda's eighth birthday party that, and that he invited all the people that he would want there, past, present and future, alive or dead. And they all just, they all came, they all came. And I've spent the last eight years of my life writing. He's getting out. You're gonna be rich and famous. And rewriting. Did you crack it yet? Oh, I'm getting so close. And rewriting. Can I hear it? Any day now. It was a strange thing because I did have so long to prepare. I had a year to get myself immersed and to add ingredients and to kind of steep myself in all things John Larson to the point where I had the luxury of showing up on set or showing up in rehearsals and I could trust him to move. And I was just, I, and I would pray to him every morning. I would say, you know, hey man, I will be your vessel. I will be your, con you know, container, like, let me help. I think uh, my imagination and your imagination is now intermingled enough where I think I will be able to feel when it's right. So I'm gonna let go now <laughs> and I'm gonna get out of the way. I'm gonna carve a hole in the ceiling and I'm gonna let you come in and just f it up, man. Like just do whatever the hell you want. And that was a really important thing to feel on this, on, a, on this particular film set was that ability to be spontaneous, that ability to be impulsive and um, un, censored because John was that in life. He was always turned up to an 11 and he wasn't, he didn't stand on kind of social kind of um, agreements. He was a very irreverent, rebellious, radical kind of punk, musical theater rock kid. And he was anti-establishment and he was in, he was the master of his own life. He made sure he was the master of his own space and every space that he went into, whether it was the diner or his own apartment or a rehearsal room, you know, he would make a, an event out of everything. He wouldn't hold a, a party for his friends. He would hold a peasant's feast, you know, like everything became a thing. Um, and so for me, it was really important that I as Andrew slash Jonathan felt that freedom to not be concerned about where the camera was and to trust that the camera was gonna be following John. And John, he just took over. He, like me and Lynn, we just let him take over. It was like, what would John do every morning? That was the question we would ask. And I think between us, between myself, and Lynn obviously has such a deep connection to John as well and his work. And there wouldn't maybe be a Lin-Manuel Miranda musical theater maestro without Tick Tick Boom, without Jonathan Larson and what he did for musical theater and how he lived. So it was like, this kind of magical, mystical, spiritual thing where he just started governing everything. He just started moving through each scene and and all I had to do was kind of let him at a certain point. And you could feel it when it happened. There were certain magical days and magical scenes and magical songs where you were like, oh, there, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. We didn't have to do anything, he just showed up. Eight years and the time keeps ticking. You need to ask, are you letting yourself be led by fear or by love? Fear, a hundred percent fear. I think the first song where I really felt John fully show up, it was Why in the Delacorte. And it was the first song that we shot and it was live singing. And it's me at the piano just kind of 
improvising a song trying to meet this impossibly emotional crux moment. And Julie Larson was on set with us that night. His sister, his wonderful sister. And we were just like, he just filled, he filled that delicor, he filled me up. And that vital moment of meeting loss, of meeting destiny, of, of meeting calling, and of meeting the ephemeral, short, sacred nature of life just kind of has to happen in that song. And you know, I prepared it and I'd created my choices and my track, but then I, I had to go like, dude, like I, I, this is too much for me to just do on my own. Like you need to be here and you need to tell me, you need to bring me through this. And he did, and it was a stunning thing. And then we were in the diner doing the Sunday sequence. And there was a moment that I could not get, 12 or 11 takes. And I got to this part every, and every time I would get to this lyric in the song, I would literally kind of like, my body would just crumble and I would kind of just, ugh, I had like an allergic, like, I can't, I can't, I don't know. And I'm just like, sorry, can we go again? And it was like, sure, he's never seen me like this. It was the one time where I was just really, really struggling. And he was like, he came in or I came out. I was like, dude, sorry, can we talk? And he was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> And, it, and I was like, I don't know how to do this. Like, John is not showing up for this. Like, what's going on? He was like, well, talk, let's go for a walk. And I'm like, well, it's this moment. And like in the song, in the way you've created it, I start singing about Sunday in the diner. And I'm and the lyric is on the soft y y yellow, purple, red stool, sit the fools who should eat at home. Like I'm dissing my patrons, but I'm looking at Andre De Shields and Joel Gray and Brian Stokes Mitchell and Cheetah Rivera and Beth Malone and you know, BB Newa. And I'm, I'm looking at them and I'm calling them fools. This isn't the way that Jonathan wrote it, man. Like he wasn't imagining this thing that you created. He was like, okay, buddy, I understand. <laughs> and I'm like, how am I supposed to call these people fools? And he was like, oh, no, no, no. You don't know who they are. They are just patrons. And I'm like, okay, got it. <laughs> like, and the only exception to that rule was Bernadette in that moment where we honor Bernadette. Otherwise, the acting adjustment was, oh no, you're not seeing them. This is for Jonathan in the sky. This is not for Jonathan in you right now. These are, these are just happen to be diner patrons that can sing really well. I'm like, okay, great, fine. You're just, a, and, and it's all in your imagination, dude. And I was like, right, right, right. Yeah, they are just people who look like those people who have really, and, and in my imagination, they have these beautiful musical theater voices, good, done, and then we got it in the next take. But yeah, in that, I, I think I was really struggling because Jonathan wouldn't, Jonathan's like, I can't call them fools, can't call them fools, can't call them fools. So we figured that out. And then we got to like actually honor Bernadette in that very, very special way, which again was Jonathan going, I need to, we need to, I can't treat her like a patron. She has to be, like this, this moment doesn't exist without her. So we have to, find a way of honoring her. Actions speak louder than They speak louder Keep going. Okay. So, so far what's been so moving about the response to the film has been, of course, it's there's an overwhelming love for it, but the specific interactions I've had with friends, friends of friends, young artists, really personal interactions I've had where they've said something along the lines of, this transcends a film for me, this is reminding me of who I am actually. God damn it. Like, and now I have to dust off my writing equipment or I have to dust off the guitar or the piano, whatever that is that makes me come alive that I've buried or I've been having doubts about my calling and now I realize I, I have to double down. I have to go back and I have to keep throwing it again. I have no choice. I know that now. Thank you for the reminder of that. Like a lot of young, young artists are having the same experience that Lynn Manuel had when he saw this show off Broadway when he was 21, 22. He hadn't written in the Heights yet. He hadn't he hadn't fully committed to being a musical theater maker. And the way the story he tells is, is exactly what so many young artists are going through right now with watching this film and seeing this story play out in the same way that Lynn did. And Lynn, it was like, it was a message in a bottle from John going, are you sure? Are you sure this is what you want to do? It might be what you want to do, but are you prepared for it being this amount of rejection, this amount of failure? You may lose friends, you may lose partners, you may not have any money, you may be destitute for decades, you may never have your creativity 
seen or honored or reflected back to you. You may never receive your flowers. Do you still want to do it? And I think a lot of young artists and actors and musicians and storytellers are watching this film going, hell yes, I have to. And I know I, I know I, when I saw the first cut that Lynn showed me of this, I felt like I was being transported back to being a 19 year old, 20 year old acting student. I needed it. That part of my psyche needed that and to go, oh no, I have to do what I have to do. There's a thread that pulls on us. It's a very unique thread that we all have that, that we, we, if we, if we let go of, we lose some of ourselves. And I think that's what this film is about. And it's, it's encouraging us to not let go of the thread.